Now moving on to um, observations of the gas, the diffuse interstellar gas um, was observed already in the early 20th century and Hartmann finds calcium absorption lines towards um, delta Orio, Ori, so um, a star at in the Orion constellation at optical wavelengths. So these are optical telescopes. Here we are at 580 something nanometers, so approximately in bluish, uh, uh, a greenish light. And what he found is certain absorption structures. We have here um, sodium um, absorption lines, but also these broad features of helium absorption. And looking at the, um, um, at the spectra in towards the star at different epochs or at different times, it was found that the spectral location of this helium line changes over time periodically. So it moves from the left to the right in a, a periodic fashion while other spectral features appear constant. And the reason for this is that um, uh, and what could what could the uh, possible reason be? So how could a spectral absorption line that is created because of quantum mechanic absorption change its frequency? And this can be done by Doppler shift. If the object that we observe is moving away or towards us, it will change the frequency. Of course, in its rest frame, the frequency is always the same. And since theta delta Ori is a binary star, so what we observe is actually two stars orbiting around a common center of gravity and the helium feature is produced by one of these stars that is orbiting. We will have a periodically changing um, absorption frequency from red to blue and back again due to the um, um, movement of the star. However, these sodium features remain constant, and so they cannot be directly related to the star. They have to come from material that is between the star and the observer. And so this is the first case of absorption of light from the interstellar by the interstellar medium. Then somewhat later, not only atomic absorption has, has been observed, but also molecules, but um, in the optical, so CH, CN and CH plus were first detected in 1937. These were the first interstellar molecules observed and this was a big surprise because it was commonly assumed that the conditions in the interstellar medium are such that it is very difficult for molecules to survive. So only atomic species were expected. When we compose nowadays our knowledge of the elemental abundances of the interstellar medium, normalize this to hydrogen, then we know that about 9% of all the elements as in helium, almost 100% in hydrogen, and then everything else is only as a trace element upon, um, appearing. So in the order of 10 to the minus four and smaller. Of those, some appear almost exclusively in the gas phase, like hydrogen and helium, but some are disappearing from the gas because they are condensating to macromolecules and solid bodies in the form of dust particles. So
So when we, op when we study the interstellar medium, we have the additional complication that some of the material is, is missing from the gas because it's bound into the dust grain. Then in 1932, Mary Heger found many spectral features in the optical, the so-called diffuse interstellar bands. So these are absorption features that are too wide to be spectral lines of atoms or molecules, but are too narrow to be uh, these very broad um, solid body bands that um, are created by um, dust particles and so on. And they appear all over the place. They appear in the, in the visual regime, but also at longer wavelengths. And they are the, the, the relative ratios between them. So between this and this feature, for example, unfortunately is not a constant, but changes from object to object which means that it cannot be created all by the same physical process or by the, by the same origin. So this is a uh, problem that is still not fully understood. One of the oldest unsolved astrophysical problems, even though we now um, have an idea of the origin of a few of those. Okay, moving on to um, the history of radio astronomy. We start in the early 30s, where Jansky was the first to detect radio waves coming from the center of the Milky Way and attributed this um, radiation to come from hot gas to be actually Bremsstrahlung, so free free radiation. We know, of course, then we, when we have charged particles that are accelerated, so for example, an electron that comes close to a proton is attracted or is scattered off the proton, then that, um, that is an acceleration, and this means it will emit radiation, depending on the strength of the acceleration and so on. It will, con it, it will create continuum radiation, so-called Bremsstrahlung. Another uh, typical case is this continuous uh, Bremsstrahlung that is created by charged particle gyrating about around a magnetic field lines. And so this is what we call then synchrotron radiation because it creates a very specific spectrum. So these are physical processes that can create continuum radio emission. And when we look at the H alpha sky map, here we have the hot gas. So we know that we have ionized hydrogen, which means we have protons and we have electrons. And what we see then is the strong Bremsstrahlung um, of these regions. And depending on the spectral characteristics of this radio um, emission, we can, um, we can understand the physics of the, of the um, corresponding region. So we all know, of course, that when we look at a black body, then it will create the typical black body spectrum. For example, let's say this is at three terahertz. Um, unfortunately, we already learned that the radiation is modified by absorption, by extinction and by reddening. So um, that means that the actual spectrum of this black body observed through the interstellar medium would, was, would deviate from, a, from a, a pure black body. So this is some, something like a gray body and this then would look like this. So we would have a slight shift here, a reddening to longer wave, to, and um, actually to, yeah. and we would have a different, a different slope here, of the, um, the long wavelength tail. And this slope is what we observe here in the Orion KL regime. 
And what we observe, for example, also here, the black body emission of the moon. This is everything that has this slope that is about 2. Not, not exactly, but about 2 is a black body or modified black body emission. So it's also the overall slope of the sun and so on. And then we have, when we look here at the radio spectra of prominent objects in the sky, we have objects that have an opposite slope. Uh, here Cassiopeia and Crab and Virgo and so on. Uh, Virgo is maybe a little bit different. And here we have this SNR. SNR stands for Supernova Remnant. Remnant. And this is a region where strong synchrotron emission is produced and they have typically this um, spectra of a slope of um, minus 0.1 or something. Um, so this is here. No. This Everything with this slope is um, a synchrotron radiation, so a region where you have strong magnetic fields, where you have many charged free particles, where you have very high kinetic energies, uh, rapidly moving uh, particles, so they produce the spectrum. And then you see here there is a kink when we look at the Orion, and this kink is then showing the transition from optically thin to optically thick um, emission in the synchrotron. So what we have here then is an indicator on the physics of the synchrotron radiation taking place here. So the radio spectrum tells us a lot about the energetics um, of the observed region. When we look at the neutral gas, we saw that um, there we have the 21 centimeter emission and this is a hyperfine transition of an excited state where the electron spin is parallel to the proton spin and where this transitions down to the ground state with antiparallel um, electron and proton spin. Um, the energy difference between the two states is very small this is called the forbidden line because the A coefficient, so the Einstein A coefficient, which is the decay probability for this spontaneous decay, is, is, is um, two times, uh, three times 10 to the minus 15 per second, which corresponds to a lifetime of the excited state of 10 to the 7 years. So this is impossible to observe in the lab, of course, and can only be observed when we have many hydrogen atoms. So when we take um, 10 to the 15 um, of these um, hydrogen atoms, we will have about one spin flip per second. So large numbers of molecules will start to emit these photons and since we have very, so uh, uh, a finite volume is very weakly emitting, but since we have extreme large volumes of atomic gas, even though they are have low densities, um, we can create, the, the, the interstellar medium can create a significant amount of this 21 centimeter emission. So this has first been detected in 1950, even though it has been predicted already five years earlier. And this is nice because this is a spectral line and when we observe a spectral line, the position of the line in the spectrum tells us something about the kinetics because the Doppler effect will shift the, uh, the line center frequency depending on the velocity of the object. So for example, when we have a cloud of gas observing at rest and we observe this, then this is the position of the line that we measure. But when we have two different objects, for example, one is moving away from us, so we will have a 
redshifted Doppler redshifted emission to lower frequencies. And we will have and we have maybe a second object that is moving in our direction. So we will have a blue shift to higher frequencies. Then by observing the spectrum, we can derive the kinematics of these two spectrum, um, interstellar clouds depending on their frequency. The same also works with um, absorption spectra. So when we observe a bright background sort of like this quasar through an interstellar cloud, radiation will be absorbed in this cloud and this is visible by this absorption dip in the quasar spectrum. Now this is important because it helped to actually derive the spiral structure of the Milky Way. And to do this, astronomers observed many hydrogen clouds in the Milky Way and tried to figure out the correct distance. This is not possible with stars because the stellar light is absorbed by dust very rapidly. So we cannot look deep into the uh, Milky Way disk, but radiation, uh, but long wavelength radiation such as radio is not absorbed, because, which means we can even observe radio radiation from the other end of the Milky Way. We just have the problem to figure out the correct distance to this cloud. And there the rotation curve of the, um, of the uh, Milky Way helps. When we look at a we know that everything in the Milky Way is rotating around the center. So when we look at, at the cloud that is sitting here, it has a velocity vector in this direction. And we have a small projection of the velocity along the line of sight. And this is what creates the Doppler shift. So the cloud C will have a slightly shifted um, a slightly shifted frequency with respect to the frame of rest. So this is basically the emission of the cloud C. There's a, um, there is an ambiguity because when we have along this circle here another cloud B but is much further away then here we will have exactly the same velocity vector than for C. And given some scatter, this is the spectrum of the cloud B. So they are very close together. So when we observe something at this frequency, it can be either very close or it can be either very far. There is one configuration where this ambiguity vanishes and this is when we observe something exactly at the tangential point, like for this object A that is also rotating. Here the actual velocity is equal to the projection. So here this cloud will have the maximum shift um, in this direction. So it's pretty clear that this needs to be the cloud A. And then we also have the possibility of a cloud D, which will have a velocity because it is outside of the solar circle that moves to in the other direction. So by looking at a certain direction, looking at a certain direction, we can identify clouds along the line of sight because they are shifted along the frequency. And we can place clouds, when we look at this direction, we can say we have a cloud here, we have a cloud here and here, and we know the direction, the, the velocity at which they are moving. And this has been done in the 50s in the radio where Spitzer first mapped the Milky Way. So we have the sun sitting here and they were looking in each direction and collecting 
identifying identical uh, uh, different clouds at different velocity uh, distances and it turned out that they are not evenly distributed but they form like rings or spiral structures with prominent gaps where we have no clouds in between and this was the first observational finding of the spiral structure of the atomic gas in the Milky Way. 